So can you tell us about your campaign stop in Tennessee tomorrow? Yes, sir. We've got one at the Blunt County Courthouse at 6.30 p.m. It's open to the public, and uh, uh, I'll be there speaking. I think uh, the Constitution Party U.S. Senate candidate will uh, also be there, and the chairman of uh, the Constitution Party for the state of Tennessee will also be there. Okay, is that Bluntville up near Bristol or Blunt County yeah, down near Knoxville? Yeah, 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 Bluntville up near Bristol. Okay. Uh, what can you tell us, uh, Congressman, about your platform with the Constitution Party? Sure. Uh, conservative on social issues, uh, consistent pro-life voting record in the state Senate and in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, solidly for traditional marriage as being between one man and one woman. Uh, I voted on that uh, in the U.S. House several times. Uh, strong Second Amendment backer. I was co-chair of the Second Amendment caucus in the U.S. House for a while. I also was the uh, sponsor of legislation to end the District of Columbia gun ban and have had the highest ratings from the NRA, Gun Owners of America, Citizens Defense League, and other Second Amendment groups. With regard to uh, financial issues, I am for a balanced budget now, not waiting 10 to years down the road to get the job done. We've got to do it now. We've got to cut discretionary spending. Uh, neither Obama nor Romney will do that. Uh, the Ryan, Paul Ryan's budget was over and dollars, over six hundred billion dollars in deficit, and it passed the highest in that form. And uh, the Obama budget over a trillion dollars in deficit. So both Romney and Obama talk about cutting spending, but they like they they don't have the courage to do it because it makes people mad. I also favor jobs in the United States for U.S. citizens first, and that's not the case with Obama and Romney. I have advocated uh, a couple of years before ever running for president a moratorium on new green card admissions to the United States until unemployment is under 5%. Uh, unemployment now is around 8%. It makes no sense to bring in so many foreign workers with green cards where they can work anywhere in the country and do it about any job they want to, and they can be uh, medium skilled or high skilled. Uh, and to bring in more foreign workers is stealing jobs from U.S. citizens. And the Democrats want them in because they're mainly from third world countries and they see them with the green card having a glide path to citizenship. And then they'll be Democratic, and you've got the big money behind the Republicans. They want them in to drive down wages. And I'm the only candidate uh, calling for that moratorium and focusing on U.S. jobs for U.S. citizens first. Okay, what would you do with the illegal aliens that are here now? Would you oh, like round them up and deport them? Oh, well, you don't have to round them up. If you took away the magnets, most of them would leave on their own. Uh, that you should not give those uh, persons illegally in the country uh, the right to send their children to uh, U.S. schools when they weren't born in this country. Uh, they don't do a thing about that. I say you can't get food stamps, you can't get public housing, you can't get uh, welfare, you can't go to unless you produce your birth certificate, naturalization certificate, or legal papers. And then uh, you, uh, employers will have to be hiring the illegals. And uh, if, 
And it's illegal to work if you're illegal in the country. If you cut off the jobs and all the freebies, uh, they'd leave. And we also need to end automatic birthright citizenship. Automatic birthright citizenship. You have people flooding over from Mexico uh, uh, to uh, Arizona, New Mexico, or Texas, or California to have children because the children uh, auto, uh, get automatic U.S. citizenship. And no, uh, that shouldn't be the way it is. If you're illegally in the country and have a child here, that child should not be an automatic citizen. Right. I mean, that's not, that doesn't happen in any other country. If you are on vacation as a tourist in Italy and you are pregnant and you have a baby while you're on vacation, that child is not automatically a citizen of Italy. You're exactly right. And most, we, you know, we're one... I, I, of the major countries, I guess we're the only one. We have the mm -hmm. most liberal immigration policy of any major country in the world. And it is, uh, it is a huge impact on uh, education, a huge impact on health care, huge impact on the prison system. And uh, the Romney and Obama won't do anything about it. I could, the debate uh, the, earlier this week between Romney and Obama indicated on this issue how close they really are. Romney talked about uh, giving uh, uh, those illegally in this country who've gone to school permanent residency. That's your first step on the way to being a citizen. That's amnesty. Now, he says he's against amnesty, but what he's for, and I, I, I heard him in Congress when he was there four years ago talking to some members of the House in the basement of the Longworth building, and he uh, he's basically for letting any of them here stay here if they want to. So uh, are you familiar with the uh, Social Security Administration's SSI disability program that, thanks to Senator Lautenberg's amendment, will pay $30,000 a year to every illegal alien who claims to be a religious refugee, primarily from communist Russia? And that's thirty thousand dollars a year. So, a, and they can still work full time as anybody can under SSI up to a certain amount. And uh, I, I, well, see, it's a, it's it's catering and coddling to illegals. And you'll never hear Romney say that. And you'll never hear Obama say it. They are paralyzed by political correctness. Well, you, and, you know, you're saying to arrest, or if they, what, what do you say should happen if they refuse to leave? If the tens of millions of illegal aliens and anchor babies refuse to leave after you cut off all their free education and free welfare, do you say arrest them and deport them at that time? Uh, it, it, I think you'll find most of them will leave. And then, uh, now they're saying we've got tremendous amount of over, uh, over amount of prison space if you have to rent mm -hmm. some to start the ball rolling. Uh, as president, I'm willing to do that because we've got to get the problem solved and I'll solve it. So you're willing to arrest uh, Hussein Obama Satoro and Willard uh, Mitt Romney as illegal aliens then, correct? <laughs> no, uh, I'm not. Uh, Obama is, uh, he would be legally in the country. I guess you were saying. I think her baby. Yeah. No, uh, Obama was. He had an American mother. He had an American mother, that's correct. But he can't be president, so. Well, uh, you know, I'm not going, I can't say yes or no on that. I think what you need to do, and, I, and I've said this before, you've got to look in his file in um, Hawaii to see what the document was signed by the doctor at the hospital. Uh, and, and then you can say yes or no whether he was born in the U.S. Yeah, the governor in the U.S. is, uh, uh, he is a citizen. If, mm -hmm. he, if he wasn't born now, uh, then he is not a citizen. And under the Constitution, you're supposed to be natural born citizen. And if he wasn't born there, I say he's not natural born and shouldn't be president. How do you think that has stained the Democratic Party? I mean, personally, my family's hardcore Democrat politicians. I've got a cousin on the Tennessee Supreme Court right now. Hardcore Democrat. Uh, I'll personally never vote Democrat again just because of Obama, not because he's black, because you've got uh, 
Ambassador uh, Alan Keyes, you got Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, we're both presidential candidates. Good American citizens, good American patriots. I would be happy for them to be president, but not, not a communist, not somebody who refuses to show his birth certificate in court, thanks to the Supreme Court, won't allow anybody to see the birth certificate as anybody else would have to produce. Uh, he's using a fake Social Security number. That's fine with the entire federal court system. So, uh, you know, I'll never vote Democrat again. It's ruined it for me. And I'm really not happy with the Republicans, so I'll probably never vote for them either. So I'm looking at third party from here on out. It's as long as there's an America, which may not be much longer. Well, let me tell you what. If we don't adopt my policies on immigration, you're bringing in so many people from other countries. We're going to... We're being swamped with a socialist mindset of uh, the government doing everything for you, which is just the wrong direction for the country. And uh, my fear with, well, not my fear, Romney will tell the voters anything they want to hear if it'll get him elected. He's changed his position. Like on life, he was pro-abortion when he was uh, in Massachusetts. Now he claims to be pro-life. He, he told the homosexual groups in Massachusetts what a great governor he was going to be for. Them. And he, by executive order, directed Massachusetts officials to issue the first homosexual marriage licenses in the country. Now he claims he's pro-traditional marriage. He's pro taking whatever position is necessary to capture majority of the votes as he sees it. And he wrote Obamacare, and wasn't he fired as governor by the citizens of uh, Massachusetts? Now, he'd run for re-election. I think he saw he couldn't get re-elected, so he moved on to something else. I mean, I, I don't see how he can get elected as president, frankly. I don't think, I think Ron Paul, who basically has your platform, uh, was the only candidate that could beat Obama, and the Republicans, uh, in my opinion and observation, and, and other people's observations, uh, the election was, was stolen from Ron Paul by fraud, by the Republican hierarchy. Uh, so I don't, so, think, yeah, I don't think Romney can get elected. Well, the Republican hierarchy does not want Ron Paul, and they would not want someone like me. No. They want someone that's malleable, and they want somebody that is going to uh, jump when the big money funders behind the Republicans want them to jump. And I'm not a jumper. Okay, uh, you're safe here for national defense on your platform. Uh, we're currently waging 10 wars, 10 hot little wars around the world which is, and we're borrowing a billion dollars a day from Communist China to do it, and the, uh, the foreign Federal Reserve Bank that, that counterfeits all our money and takes all our taxes in the form of... Uh, uh, I, I say, yes, I'm for a strong national defense, but if you balance the budget, you've got to cut the fence along with everything else. Well, I don't see how the defense arming al-Qaeda with... Uh, Hillary Clinton just announced she's given $26 million to al-Qaeda in Syria. We just used al-Qaeda to overthrow Libya, which, I mean, I'm ex-military. I was in the Air Force. I was on the mission in 1987 that bombed uh, Colonel Gaddafi's home in Libya, a first strike sneak attack by our bases uh, in, uh, in England. Position on, on Libya, uh, 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 Syria, uh, Unless Congress declares war, we don't go there. The Constitution says Congress should declare war. So that's an impeachable unless, offense. Unless Congress declares war uh, in Afghanistan, we're coming home from there. Yeah, that's a nice little 11-year-old uh, war. We've been at war in Iraq for 20-something uh, years, 25 years almost, nonstop, um, twice as long as Vietnam. We don't have anybody guarding the border here in America. Where was the military on 9-11? Uh, Bush and Cheney had a stand-down order with Rumsfeld. We had a Canadian general in charge of NORAD who ordered the Air Force to stand down on 9-11. You know, we don't have a military defending America. We need to bring them, uh, my opinion is, bring them home. I, made, I'm, I was stationed overseas. I'm, I'm for bringing the troops home. Let them live here. Let that money pour into the local economy. If we want to face uh, and uh, let them make sure no illegals cross the border. That's their job, and we're not letting them do their job. I mean, right. getting back to Libya, I mean, my job in, in, 
and that was, was helping to load the bombs on the jets that killed Gaddafi's daughter. And Dr. Stoney Merriman was a, uh, he was editor of the Carthage, Tennessee newspaper, Al Gore's hometown, after he left the Pentagon. And at the Pentagon, he was chief of public affairs for the U.S. Marine Corps. And when he came back from that job, he was telling his friends here in Tennessee that U.S. Special Forces went in and rescued Gaddafi just hours before the U.S. jets bombed his home, just in case there were visiting world leaders at his house who would be killed as collateral damage. So here we are rescuing uh, these so-called enemies, and then we bomb their home in a big dog and pony show. And it came out later that uh, Israel was running a... Uh, what you call a false flag covert radio broadcast from Tripoli, which was the whole trigger of that bombing, was they were pretending to be Libyans confessing to a terrorist attack, but it was Israeli Mossad broadcasting that. So the whole thing was a fraud. You know, all these foreign wars, these countries just want to sell gas to us at 10 cents a gallon, which is the price of gas in many countries today. It was 6 cents a gallon in Iraq before we bombed them. You know, we got the oil in Alaska, which goes to British Petroleum, which they export to Communist China, Japan, and Mexico. We don't even get the oil in Alaska. You know, as president, would you fix these things? Well, I, I want us to be energy independent in this country. And uh, uh, it, it, now, when oil hits the market, though, it's, 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 it's like a, uh, a fungible item that uh, it's whatever the market is. But if we... If we drilled in this country, drilled for natural gas, and opened up coal again, uh, we would be able to be energy independent. We yes, that's, uh, I mean, I remember driving a car when gas was 25 cents a gallon. Well, I remember driving a car on gasoline made from coal, and the EPA ratcheted the regulations down so tight that you can't make gasoline from coal anymore and meet the EPA regs. Hmm. I got it right there. Uh, I got that coal, gasoline from coal uh, between Abington and Bristol. It was several stations there that sold that type of gasoline. And they sold it for the same price as regular gasoline. But the, it, it, it had a high sulfur content and it, they couldn't keep on doing it. That was back in the... Uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Now, on international relations, you're talking about uh, you want to balance the budget. That means cutting out foreign aid, doesn't it? Absolutely. I was the most vigorous opponent of foreign aid when I was in Congress, and uh, uh, Paul Ryan would never want to cut foreign aid, and uh, Bush didn't want to cut it. Uh, Obama, he wants to increase it. Bush increased it over Clinton. I thought it was awful under Clinton. It got worse under Bush, and under Obama, it's even gotten worse. If I'm president, you're going to see a foreign aid uh, uh, budget that'll take a huge U-turn, and uh, that's, one, that's one of the first things I'll cut out. Okay. Um, so that would save trillions of dollars right there. I think Israel alone has gotten a trillion dollars in foreign aid. Uh, it, well, the foreign aid, foreign operations, appropriations committee is... It's uh, between, uh, it was around 50 billion a year in 2009. I assume it's probably up maybe to 60 billion. It's not a trillion a year. No, not a year, but in the uh, well, history of Israel. Yeah, I mean, Egypt uh, over the last three and a half decades has gotten 48 billion. Israel gets about 4 billion a year. Uh, Jordan gets about, it's almost a billion. And uh, Egypt. Got uh, well over a billion. I, I think it's around two or three billion. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to have money to stay here. Uh, I agree. Getting back to the uh, the tax situation, I believe your platform calls for the elimination of the income tax, elimination of the IRS, and a temporary modified fair tax until things get back under control. 
Is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, no, what I did in Congress, that, that, that's in the Constitution Party yes. platform. I voted to terminate the current tax code on a date certain in the future and replace it. You've got options. Consumption tax, which I would prefer, would, you wouldn't have an income tax, you wouldn't have a state tax. Uh, you would have uh, basically a sales tax. Now, if you can't get that done, another option would be a flat tax. Just everybody uh, pay the same percentage after a uh, nice standard deduction. And uh, you can do that. Uh, and there are other things you can look at. But I want the tax code to be simple and fire and not have book after book of regulations and uh, uh, interpretations. Now, how do you feel about the private foreign Federal Reserve Bank that counterfeits all our money out of thin air and then loans it to the government at a billion dollars uh, a day interest? Would we nationalize the private saying, Federal Reserve? I was, in, uh, I was in Ron Paul's study group, and we were uh, the first to advocate for a full audit. I think if you have a full audit and people see what's going on, the situation would uh, uh, create such a clamor. Well, it already has caused the House to pass the full audit bill this year. So I, I supported that uh, when there were a few supporters of it. But it, it, but it did finally pass this year in the House. But it's not going to pass the Senate. Well, um, you know, the country can't survive until it does pass. I mean, until that bill passes and what Ron Paul believed in was eliminating the foreign Federal Reserve Bank and putting the government in charge of counterfeiting the money, <laughs> printing the money, excuse me, uh, with no interest. I don't see how we can pay a billion dollars a day interest and survive. Yeah, well, you've got it you right on point there. Um, now, at the debates, you're banned from the debates. How do you feel about that? Well, the debates are controlled by uh, former Democrats and former Republicans, and uh, uh, they don't want any third party in the debate. If the public had the chance to hear my views and the views of some others, you would see a totally different uh, election. Uh, yeah, my understanding is people don't even know that the third parties exist. Most people, they've uh, never heard of them. People don't. No, because, and this is one thing that I'm opposed to, is the super PAC paying for all these ads, and they're anti-Obama, anti-Romney. And I'm for individual donations only, no PAC donations, and then have full disclosure of the individuals. How do you feel about uh, Obama ordering the police to arrest the presidential nominee for the Green Party and the vice, pres the vice presidential nominee for the Green Party Tuesday when they tried to attend the presidential debate? Election on November 6th, and we are here to bring that courage to this blocked debate, this mockery of a democracy that we deserve and only we can take it back and make it democratic once again. So we're going to go now and we're going to represent uh, the 85 percent of the people across this country that uh, agree that we should be in here and be a part of the debates today. So let's give your names, please. Uh, give your names. Uh, Jill Stein, Green Party presidential candidate. Yay, and I'm Jill. Sherry Honkla, the vice presidential Green Party candidate. C-H-E-R-I-H-O-N-K-A-L-A. Jill Stein, J-I-L-L-S-T-E-I-N. Okay, on, on behalf of democracy, uh, we think that democracy starts today with opening up the debates for every single political party in the United States of America to be a part of the debate system, not just corporate America-sponsored debates.
Ladies and gentlemen, you are obstructing the vehicle of pedestrians and traffic. If you refuse to move, you are subject to arrest. I am ordering you to immediately leave this roadway, move along the sidewalk. If you do so voluntarily, no charges will be lodged against you. If you do not comply, you will be arrested immediately. To block traffic? Our First yeah. Amendment rights to go in there. So you're refusing to move. We have no, we in no way want to block any traffic. So you're refusing to move. We just want to get into the debates. But you're blocking traffic, we so you refuse to move. Our first All right, John. Rights. Thank you. Remove them. Bring them back. Come on, Thank you. Watch the flag. Thank you. 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 Right, everybody, we're going to ask you to please Stand back. tall, ladies. Hey, guys. Jill Stone, I, I think they should have lied them uh, uh, to attend. Uh, I also question why they were detained and handcuffed for all day down. So they've been released now? Yeah. I mean, that, they, were, they were released. I don't know how late it was, but they had... The uh, uh, Jill Stein said they detained her for eight hours. Yeah, the, I saw the video on YouTube. And I had to turn it off. It was so brutal that what the police did that you know in an earlier time there would have been a lot of violence had that actually occurred in previous years. I mean, you've got the Battle of Athens, Tennessee, which uh, you may be familiar with that from 1947, where. Uh, the crooked local government machine was actually shooting voters at the polling station if they tried to vote for the wrong party. And so the veterans rose up, hundreds of them, and it became a shootout between hundreds of police and hundreds of veterans, and the veterans actually made citizens arrest of the entire McMinn County, Tennessee Sheriff's Office, along with some election commissioners and state legislators, and arrest them. And the governor refused to send National Guard, and, and the veterans took over the county till the next election. They became the police force. And, you know, you got the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which was over gun control, but uh, when you see the, the police violently arresting presidential candidates during a presidential election in the United States, uh, you know, I understand why they put fluoride in the water now. Keeps people calm. It's the key ingredient of Prozac. Uh, that came in right after the Battle of Athens. But the arrest of Jill Stein, I mean, George W. Bush arrested uh, the Constitution Party nominee during one of the debates and the Libertarian Party nominee during one of the debates for trying to attend the debate with a ticket in their hand, apparently. Do you recall that? That, that's not all the details of it, no. Yeah, it's old, old history now, back in 2000 and 2004. I know uh, Ralph Nader uh, was threatened with arrest at one of the debates when he was the Green Party nominee, and he said, look, I'd rather be a plaintiff than a defendant in court, so he walked away and then sued him and won, uh, sued the state trooper who threatened to arrest him illegally, because it was an illegal arrest. It's an illegal arrest of Jill Stein. Um, you know, and I was Ralph Nader's chauffeur, both here in Tennessee and over in California, and I know him, and uh, I've interviewed him, and, and he's a very smart person, and he said these are illegal arrests of these nominees. So, how do you feel about the Southern Poverty Law Center calling the Constitution Party and their nominees and their voters uh, as domestic terrorists? Well, I'm not a domestic terrorist. I'm for individual rights and the Bill of Rights. And their characterization of that is not only inaccurate, it is flat out wrong. I know we had a Constitution Party, a local Constitution Party candidate in Blount County, Tennessee. He came and spoke at the, the WBCR uh, radio listeners meeting, which I have a radio show on. And, uh, you know, he gave a nice little speech, but he was an active duty police officer. And at the end of the meeting, he wanted everybody to sign their name and put their phone number and their address down, you know, to support him supposedly to support getting people on the ballot from the Constitution Party. But it, to me, it smacked of something from the Southern Poverty Law Center who advises all the police departments that we're terrorists if we vote third party. 
Uh, it seemed like an intelligence gathering operation almost to me. I mean, I, again, I, you know, I'm not sure with all the facts, but any characterization by the Southern Poverty Law Center that, uh, that myself and Jim Tyler climb as our terrorists is totally wrong. They don't want to face facts. And we, we're standing for the uh, Bill of Rights uh, more so than anything they're doing, I can tell you that. Yeah, no, they've got it. Uh, I looked on Wikipedia. I thought it was just a few uh, organizations that they listed as terrorists. It's a thousand different corporations, nonprofits, and things they list as terrorists, including a lot of churches. So it's it's very disturbing. Then when you look into Morris Dees, the attorney who runs the Southern Poverty Law Center, and you read his divorce documents filed by his wife, she accuses him of pedophilia, incest, adultery, homosexuality. That's the guy running the Southern Poverty Law Center, according to court documents. So are you familiar with him, with his history? Uh, you know, in a general way, but not all the details. Yeah, you can read all of the, the actual court documents online if you get a, if you get really bored late at night. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to add to the? Uh, you're coming over to the uh, front field then tomorrow evening. Yes, uh, I'll be shooting video uh, just to hear what you have to say and get that on the, the TV stations here in Knoxville. We won't broadcast that uh, until closer to the election, but I will be on the radio today uh, all over East Tennessee with this interview. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to meeting you tomorrow night. Okay, and, and thank you for sticking your neck out here and, and not just retiring with a big pension and, and like most congressmen. All right. No, we, uh, uh, America needs to get on the right path. It's not on the right path now. And uh, uh, thank you for your interest in uh, uh, helping us at least have the opportunity to get a message out. Okay, thank you, sir. And have a safe evening and a good trip to Blountville tomorrow. All right, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Okay, folks, that was Congressman Virgil Good from Virginia, who's running for the Constitution Party candidate for President of the United States in 2012. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. I appreciate that introduction and I want to say first thanks to each of you for being here on a Friday night when there are many high school football games. I, I won't talk too long. We'll have some questions and I hope you can certainly make the second half uh, if you need to leave and go to that. I'm also very impressed with the number of young people here in the uh, audience. Uh, thank each of you for coming out. I went as a child with uh, uh, to the, a number of political events with my dad who was active in local politics and uh, it's uh, great to see so many young persons here because uh, the problems in the country will uh, fall up on your shoulders and need your guidance and leadership in the years ahead. So thank you for being here. I also want to say thanks to Joe Coffey who is chairman of the Constitution Party for the State of Tennessee very active nationally and has done, along with a number of others of you in the room here tonight, a lot of work. And in Tennessee, unlike a number of other states, uh, you have fought for ballot access and have gotten it. I can't tell you how much time and particularly money In New York, uh, we spent, uh, I, I think it was over $25,000 just to get on the ballot this time. And we had to spend a lot of money in a number of other states, Alabama being one. And uh, uh, it, it varies across the country. The requirements are different uh, in different states. but. Uh, your work here has enabled ballot access uh, 
to be part of the Tennessee voting process, not just in presidential years, but in other years. And it's been a constant fight. Y'all have had lawsuits, you prevailed, and that, that takes time, takes energy. And if you want to shake them up in Washington this fall, you will vote for me for president. Amen. But if you want to shake them up in Tennessee and Washington, <laughs> vote for Kermit. Amen. They will talk. And yeah, yeah. Let's see, Kermit, you're running. Bob Porker's running for re-election. Who else is running in the race? A libertarian? I believe so, but... Uh, uh, the Democrat. race is between. What? Is that a Democrat? Who's a Democrat? His name is Mark Clayton, I believe. Okay. If you will work hard and give Kermit a victory, if at all possible, if not a good showing over in Nashville when they meet for the uh, state legislature, they'll be talking about it big time if he has a good showing. Amen. And in the Senate coat room up there in Washington, uh, we could just imagine if we were a fly on the wall, <laughs> Bob Corker would be in that if he were to squeak out a victory. Let's assume he wins. He said, can you beat uh, Kermit, he got 10% of the votes. I'm going to have to get out here and pay more attention to more people tonight. <laughs> Amen, brother, because that's what we want. Amen. And you can make that happen. Don't let them tell you you're wasting your vote. Amen. Voting for Kermit and the Constitution Party, if they're right on the principles, you are not wasting your vote. And in fact, you can change it up. few of the issues uh, that I'm focused on and it will uh, coincide with many that Kermit said. First of all, balancing the budget. We have got to balance the budget now, not 10 years down the road. Both Romney and Obama. Obama talked about balancing the budget in 2008. The deficit is over a trillion this year, same last year and same year before that, and the debt has skyrocketed to 16 trillion. He's not going to do it. And if you listen closely to Mitt Romney, he's not going to do it. Amen. In the debate last week, uh, well, earlier this week, you really couldn't tell too much difference. That so much was the same. Uh, he... Romney said he was for expanding Pell Grants and student loans. Listen, certainly the nice thing to say to not make anyone mad, but look, if you're for balancing the budget now, you can't be giving money to everyone for everything. First thing I think they ought to whack out it's foreign aid. Yes. When I was in when I was in Congress, we asked Paul Ryan and Harry, uh, uh, please cut foreign aid. It makes no sense to send all this money to Pakistan, Iraq, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, South America. Just keep shoveling it on out of here. When we have problems in this country that need addressing, but more importantly. You got to balance the budget, Amen. and right there is at the top of the list for me to cut. I mentioned uh, in response to Kermit, it makes no sense to pay taxpayer money for a chunk of the Democratic National Convention, a chunk of the Republican National Convention, and give money to federal candidates for office. You would have thought the Democrats and Republicans could have agreed on that. That would have hit them a little bit, but it had been, as Kermit said, the right thing to do. Yes. If you want to do that, if you're going to cut your pocket, don't do it. I mean, when I was up there, I suggested cutting office expenses. Didn't take a pay rate. Well, I gave mine back to charities in the area. Uh, but the office expenses have gone up. The committee staff that did cut it 5% this year 
Should have been five times that. Uh, didn't happen. But we've got to balance the budget now, and that means cutting everything across the board. I, uh, except uh, veterans' benefits, uh, agriculture, yes. Defense, we've got to cut defense too. You've got to cut food stamps. Kermit mentioned no child left behind. I voted no on no child left behind. But Bush, he urged Republicans to vote for it. We need to just eliminate no child left behind, save a lot of federal bureaucrats. And if I'm president, we're not going to have a secretary of education. And that's a big salary and a big staff that's going out to Amanda immediately. Woo. Protect the life of the unborn. Always been pro-life state legislature and at the federal level. Obama has always been pro-abortion. Romney was pro-abortion in two campaigns, but now he says he's pro-life. I hope he truly is. Pro-traditional marriage. Absolutely uh, for that. I am a, uh, supported the Virginia Marriage Amendment and over around, or it might be as much as 32 or 33, at least 30 states have adopted a marriage amendment saying marriage is between one man and one woman. And you have uh, two federal judges in the Ninth Circuit override what the citizens of California voted on. Yeah. And the Obama administration wants judges to be the deciders of that issue. Wrong, in my view. Absolutely wrong. And you had two judges in the Second Circuit uh, uh, two days ago said, we're going to knock out. Well, we are changing... Uh, uh, we're not going to follow DOMA because uh, it defines marriages between one man and one woman. Let me tell you, I personally believe that that's not right. But, you talk, Obama and Romney both talk about balancing the budget. I'm waiting for both of them to step forward and say, if you allow homosexual couples to delve into Social Security like traditionally married couples, you are talking about tens of billions of dollars in impact on the Social Security Trust Fund, which in my view should be separate and apart in a lockbox so Congress can't dip into it. Under the regime of Newt Gingrich, and Bill Clinton, they claim they had a balanced budget. They did not unless you say you were right to use hundreds of millions of dollars in Social Security fund and pour it over into the general fund. We really haven't had a balanced budget for decades and decades and decades. And they didn't then either. And I didn't vote for the BBA because it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. And time has definitely proven me correct on that. Yes. But the impact on the federal budget, if you wipe out defined marriage as being between one man and one woman, the impact on the Department of Defense budget. Now the Republicans say we need to spend two trillion more dollars on defense over the next ten years. But they haven't talked about the adverse impact on the defense budget if uh, gay couples are granted BAQ and other benefits that go to couples that are traditionally married. Huge negative impact on the defense budget. Another, and this was the case that they argued the other day, if a husband or wife dies, and uh, the husband or wife's estate is subject to the federal estate tax. It's, you don't pay estate tax if it goes to the spouse. I agree with that. But if you allow homosexuals to have that same situation, I'll tell you what's going to happen. People look at how 
in many instances, the money's going to go. You're going to have uh, 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 two men, just uh, one of them's going to be worth a billion dollars, sign a contract saying, you know, we're a gay couple now. And when you die, that ten billion's coming to me at zero taxes. Mm -hmm. And that, that could have been the situation, well, I don't, I don't know the details of the case. But that is exactly what two to one said on the cir second circuit. An absurd decision in my opinion. And I hope the Supreme Court doesn't go along with it. But even if it does, it's not a judicial decision. That was clearly legislating. And judges are not supposed to legislate. The judges that overturned what the people of California voted on were legislating. They were saying, we are the ultimate authority. You are not the ultimate authority. And uh, uh, and those that think that are badly, badly mistaken. Second Amendment. Constitution Party, in addition to being strong pro-life, strong traditional marriage, has an outstanding history of standing for the Second Amendment. I've always had the highest ratings with the NRA and gun owners of America. Obama got an F with GOA a few years ago and Mitt Romney had a D minus. Mitt Romney as governor of Massachusetts signed an assault weapon ban which would include a 30 6 and any of you like to deer hunt that means your guns out the door will be illegal if the Romney bill in Massachusetts were to apply in Tennessee and fly across the line in Virginia. But now Romney says he's changed his mind he wants the NRA to back him. Uh, so I, I hope he really has changed his mind. But you got a choice in this election. I've always voted Second Amendment. I've always voted pro-life. And I've always voted uh, for traditional marriage. And there's something to be said for consistency. And uh, if you're for those three things, I'd vote for somebody you know that has a long history of sticking with you rather than somebody that was with you today Maybe one with you tomorrow, and you don't know how it's going to be the next day. Kermit mentioned require a full Federal Reserve audit. I support that. Supported it when I was in a Liberty Study group with Ron Paul. That has advanced much further than I thought. This year it passed the U.S. House and got Democratic and Republican support. So I want to commend them for passing it in the House. Job. <laughs> Romney and Obama both say jobs is their top priority. And if you listen to the Super PAC ads, those 30 second ads that are funded by the billionaires and the hundred millionaires against Obama and against Romney. Uh, it's always, not always, many times it's about jobs. What Obama is not doing for jobs or what Romney is not doing for jobs. I'll tell you something neither one of them is doing. We let so many people from foreign countries into this United States every year with green cards. A green card means you can go to work to, and do about any job you want to in Tennessee. Under Obama and under Bush, 1.2 million a year. Of that 1.2 million, about three fourths of working age persons. My proposal is no more green cards with a few minor exceptions until unemployment's under 5%. That means the American citizen would be first in line for U.S. jobs. And very simple thing to do. We must do that. And it's time for the American worker to be first for a U.S. job. Not someone from uh, India, not someone from the Middle East, not someone from Africa, not someone from Asia who's gotten a green card. We need jobs for the U.S. citizen first. Easily done. No way when unemployment's 8% give or take a, a tenth of a percentage point or two, should you be letting in so many foreign green card workers. Easy to do and would help 
the unemployment rate in this country significantly. And I'm for stopping illegal immigration by stopping the magnets of illegal immigration. It is. We should not allow persons come into this country illegally, have a child, that child's an automatic citizen eligible for Medicaid, which you're going to get, public housing, or public assistance, and food stamps. And who's paying for it? Long-term citizens. Just come on in, have a kid, and the taxpayers of the United States are paying for it. Wrong. And before you go to public schools, and neither Obama nor Romney's for this, you need to produce your... I, when Catherine went to public schools, I had to get her birth certificate from Richmond, take it and show it to Fairham Elementary. But if you're from uh, another country, you don't have to show a birth certificate. They call it discrimination or something like that or an unfair burden. What I think it is, you should have to show your birth certificate, your naturalization certificate, or your legal papers making you a resident of the United States legally at this time. If you don't, your kids don't get in public schools and you can't get food stamps unless you show that. You can't get public housing. You can't get SSI. You can't get these programs. But that's not the way it is. Now they'll tell you, oh, we passed a law saying that the illegal couldn't get Medicaid. They don't make them produce a birth certificate. They don't make them produce a naturalization certificate. And they don't make them produce legal papers. And you can take in uh, a... Uh, a receipt for a utility bill, that'd probably get you back some connection to the community, they say. But that's, you need to be tough on your enforcement standards. If you would, many in this country illegal would say, you know what, we're not getting food stamps. We're not getting a free public education. We don't have a Medicaid card. Now, I'm not getting uh, public housing. I guess we better go on back. And that will happen. Yes. The PCers in the United States don't want to admit that, but that's exactly what would happen. Now, you say, well, it doesn't make sense. Why aren't the Democrats for this, and why aren't the Republicans for it? Simple. Democrats aren't for it because they really want the persons illegally here, most are from third world countries, to give them amnesty and then give them permanent residence. And if you remember last night in the debate, and most people don't know in general public what permanent residence says, uh, Romney said, we're going to give permanent residence to those uh, persons that have come over here, had kids. No, not had kids, they are automatic. It's that they've come to this country at a young age, we're going to give them permanent residence, even though they came in illegally. The lie path to citizenship. Democrats want that. Why do the Democrats want that? They're going to vote Democratic most likely. Third world countries vote, persons that come here overwhelmingly vote Democratic. And you'll say, well, why are the Republicans going along with it? A lot of rank and file Republicans, and uh, Kermit was there and talked with a Republican state representative right here from uh, Tennessee just a few minutes ago when we were over at the restaurant. He really wouldn't be for that, I don't think. But the big money backers of the Republican Party, they want as many people in here as they can to drive down wages. And when they are writing so many checks and giving so much to the PACs that are behind the Republicans, they're not going to get out here and talk about that much. I'd like to say that uh, the only other time I've been to Bluntville was for the Bristol Motor Race. So, uh, but I was reading the historical markers outside tonight, outside this courthouse, and it said that in the Civil War, in the Battle of Bluntville, the federal government came in and bombed this courthouse, burned it to the ground, and that set the whole city on fire, and it burned to the ground, all the churches and houses and businesses. Um, carry that forward to today, and in 2012, Department of Homeland Security has ordered 
one and a half billion hollow point bullets, which are illegal to use for war or for hunting, or they're useless for target practice. Uh, back in 2000, the National Security Agency declassified something called Operation Northwoods. And that's a report signed by the Pentagon's top ranked general on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's the highest ranking general in the United States Army. He signed off on it, ordering U.S. military and CIA to hire enemy soldiers to attack U.S. military bases and for the U.S. government to commit terrorist acts inside the United States to blame foreign patsies and justify a war. And that would have been a world war with Russia. Uh, my question is, have either of these candidates read Operation Northwoods completely or heard of it? And if so, do you think that was perhaps a confession to what happened on 9-11? And if so, will the next attack be far, far worse? And what can we do about it? I haven't uh, read anything about Northwoods, but um, based on what you just said, I'll, I'm going to do some looking very soon, and I want to thank you for bringing that forth because uh, uh, I think most Americans would agree that that's the U.S. government shouldn't be doing something like that, and maybe. Uh, it, seems similar to what they did with Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that either, um, but that's a fascinating thing and I definitely will study into it because I look at some of those kinds of things. As far as, uh, you are absolutely correct, as far as the Geneva and Hague Conventions being prior military, that that we study those things about what we can and can't, the types of weapons to use, the types of ammunition to use, and hollow points are not, uh, I don't understand why our government has ordered, or that particular agency has ordered the amounts of ammunition. If you took all of the agents within Homeland Security and you multiply the bullets and give them each one of them, they would probably have years and years worth of ammunition. So I, yeah, I'm astonished when I read those kinds of things. Uh, as far as governments being involved in clandestine operations against other governments or against their own people, it, don't, it doesn't shock me. I'm not surprised by those kinds of things. Uh, but it needs to be investigated if that's true. Just like uh, recently, I think there was a PBS documentary about 9-11. Uh, and they had lots of engineers and uh, I think there were structural engineers and architects on there talking about the design of, of the World Trade Centers. And this was a public broadcasting system documentary. This wasn't just some fringe element that said this is what it is. And there were lots of people that were uh, had been given world-class prizes in the way of physics or scientists that were saying there are some issues here. And uh, the way that they're mandated by uh, the insurance agencies and fire protections agencies to investigate this stuff and none of this stuff was done. They immediately started hauling it off. So there's lots of unanswered questions to those things and there's uh, and more investigation needs to be done. I'm curious as to why we need to, that kind of amounts of ammunition, especially when it doesn't serve any purpose that I'm aware of other than uh, self-defense. But I don't know that they can bend, burn up that kind of ammunition in self-defense unless they expect a whole lot of people to turn on them.